day, everybody. Uh, my name is Ed Mills, and welcome to this webinar uh, addressing uh, the COVID response and how it's relevant to uh, emerging economies in the global health context. This webinar is put on by Cytel, company I work for, and Sitara, company my colleague Craig Rayner, who will co-moderate with me, uh, it works for. So we have six people involved at the webinar today. Um, two moderators, so you won't hear a lot from us, um, Ed Mills and, and Craig Rayner will be moderating. And then in terms of the order of speakers, we have James Orbinski from York University, Derek Angus from Pittsburgh University, uh, Robin Mogg from uh, Gates Medical Research Institute, and Trevor Mundell from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I'm going to kick this off right away, and uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce my dear friend, James Orbinski. He's a physician and a professor at York University, Dadale Institute for Global Health Research. He has many years of experience in the field uh, in the context of humanitarian work. Uh, he began with um, Dr. Zodat Borders, MSF. Uh, he did a, a large number of field um, expeditions with MSF. He's perhaps the bravest man I've ever met um, during 1994 genocide in Rwanda while uh, while military organizations were afraid to go in, James went in and set up, took over MSF there and led the main hospital in Kigali. He then uh, continued um, after the genocide in the DRC and has worked in a number of other countries uh, throughout Africa. He became international president of MSF and was uh, steering the organization when they won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he then set up the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative that he's going to talk about today and um, came back to Canada a number of years ago where he's held academic positions and then uh, created the organization Dignitas International. Uh, most recently, he's joined York University um, leading their Global Health Institute. Good morning, James. Welcome. Hi, Ed. <clears throat> it's great to be here uh, with uh, this fantastic uh, panel. So James, I wonder if I could ask you a few questions. Uh, we're, we're limited for time, but I would like to hear your um, honest opinion about issues in this current pandemic. The first one I'd like to ask you is that given all of your experience working overseas, you're surely in contact with your network of family and friends around the world. What are you hearing from individuals um, in some of the poorest settings, let's say in Africa, about the public health response and day-to-day -day life in the current uh, pandemic? I think the best way to answer it is just to give you a very concrete example. Um, in Malawi, uh, I have a number of friends uh, that uh, I've been working with uh, for some uh, 15 years. There's one young uh, gentleman that uh, I'm speaking with really on a daily basis. Uh, I met him about uh, 15 years ago when he was a 12-year-old uh, orphan. Uh, he's now running uh, the orphanage uh, uh, wherein I first met him. Uh, and their number one concern uh, is infection prevention uh, and control around, uh, around COVID. And the impacts that they're uh, experiencing in that very specific uh, orphanage uh, are really about food uh, security, food shortages, uh, uh, because of a loss of uh, employment, uh, real concerns uh, around um, uh, uh, an actual um, COVID presence in their community. Uh, and then at the same time, massive uh, instability across the entire country uh, because the government has imposed a or sought to impose a very rigorous lockdown. Um, and they, in that particular situation, the Supreme Court, in fact, recently ruled that the government has to reevaluate uh, its lockdown uh, strategy, and it, it did that as there were massive protests across the entire country and people carrying placards uh, essentially saying, I'd rather die of COVID than of starvation. Uh, so that kind of paints a picture for you um, of, of uh, a particular reality, but various dimensions of that reality are present throughout the developing world. The other big issue is that you see, for example, massive impacts uh, in uh, around um, uh, health systems uh, delivery uh, of, of uh, ongoing services. And so, for example, with tuberculosis, there's a massive impact uh, already uh, in terms of uh, detection, uh, failure of detection. People are not reporting, systems are not working, 
Uh, and if there are uh, extended lockdowns for upwards of uh, uh, um, three months, we could see um, uh, an, inc um, uh, an increase in TB mortality uh, that would be uh, uh, truly, truly uh, uh, extraordinary. Uh, and so the numbers that uh, Stop TB, for example, are putting out are suggesting that upwards of 1.4 million more people would die uh, over the next five years, uh, in addition to the 1.5 million that die every year uh, of TB because of uh, the impacts of lockdowns. So this is a, a an incredibly uh, impactful uh, global pandemic, and most especially in the developing world. James, you've been involved in the access to medicines campaigns, as well as in development of drugs and vaccines through Drugs for Neglected Disease Initiative, MSF, um, Dignitas. How does the COVID response either resemble or differ in terms of uh, what you're experiencing? Well, I think that you know when we when MSF launched uh, its Access to Essential Medicines campaign uh, at the end of the, the 20th century, 1999, um, uh, the world was a very different place than it is now. And we have certainly come a very very long way uh, in terms of building uh, um, a common understanding uh, of global interdependence. And not simply in terms of, of uh, vulnerability to particular uh, uh, zoonotic diseases like COVID, uh, but also in terms of our ability and our willingness uh, to work across sectors around common objectives. So I think uh, you know in the late 90s, uh, MSF's main uh, one of the MSF's main roles was to advocate and and introduce uh, the concept uh, of equity. Uh, to global public health thinking and introduce uh, the concept uh, that treatment, for example, for HIV is not independent of prevention. And yet here we are now 20 years later and the concept of equity is really, uh, it, it's reached a new salience, I think, and, and uh, in, in, a, in a very good way. And I, you know, one of the things that I, that j just to kind of mark that major change, uh, the WHO, uh, the EU, France, and the Gates Foundation um, uh, in late April, April 24, they launched uh, the, the uh, Access to COVID Tools Accelerator uh, Initiative, the ACT Initiative, as it's now called. And this is uh, uh, an initiative that is focused on uh, developing drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines um, uh, around the principle of equitable access to those new healthcare technologies. And that is a, uh, uh, I could not have imagined such an initiative back in 1999. So the world really has changed radically uh, over the last 20 years. Now there are obviously some key challenges uh, around uh, this ACT initiative. Uh, and one is funding, of course, and a second uh, is governance and, and, a, and an appropriate uh, mechanism, if you will, for determining uh, which healthcare technologies are appropriately investigated, which ones are supported, uh, uh, and then when, where, and how access is actually uh, ensured. So those are you know, some, some big picture, if you will, uh, major, major uh, differences and developments. Um, uh, in terms of how we think about access to healthcare technologies, and most especially uh, the concept of equitable access to healthcare technologies. So that that's very interesting because it leads me to wonder: uh, a lot of your work during the HIV epidemic was access to medicines, and then the di distribution of medicines, simplification of services, and getting um, getting these healthcare technologies into the most rural environments. Have you been wondering about that in this current climate? Oh, absolutely. You know, the I think the the um, you know when uh, when we started the DNDI, the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, it was really focused on and still is focused on the most neglected diseases uh, and um, bringing the best of science and the best of of, of uh, global health policy to bear on those particular diseases. And these were diseases that were neglected because there was not a viable market uh, for the products that might be developed to to uh, to address them. And you know, in the simplest of terms, poor people don't have uh, money, uh, therefore there's not a lot of money to be made from poor people. Um, but in this situation, uh, we have a global 
uh, uh, virus, a pandemic that poses a, a risk uh, to virtually all people. And the challenge now is to bring the best of science to bear um, and to include uh, communities in the developing world in the scientific process. And that I think is, is critical uh, to first of all, appropriate priority setting. Secondly, um, and, and uh, um, to your point, ensuring uh, that the outcome, the fruits, if you will, of that scientific enterprise are actually appropriately targeted uh, to uh, the most vulnerable, uh, uh, the most vulnerable people, and it includes the most vulnerable people in 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 uh, uh, in the world. And this is now this is this is a uh, this is a pandemic for which there's at this time no treatment, no vaccine. We don't know the nature of immunity, and we know that there will be mutation. We're already starting to see this emerge in various parts of the world. And so this is, by definition, a challenge of the global commons, and it requires a very systematic and targeted strategy for ensuring that that challenge uh, is addressed appropriately. Thank you. What kind of strategic partnerships would you like to see occurring at this time? Well, I think the, you know, the, uh, the initiative that that uh, the WHO has has uh, uh, put forward, the ACT initiative, the Access to COVID Tools uh, Accelerator, I think is exactly the kind of of uh, uh, of partnership uh, structure, if you will, uh, that um, uh, is necessary in this context. Um, it is it is very much focused on uh, developing. Uh, appropriate healthcare technologies, drugs, diagnostics, and vaccines, but doing so with a very clear and unequivocal commitment uh, to equitable access to those healthcare technologies. And again, uh, you know, the the um, uh, the 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 issue I, I raised it earlier. Uh, the issue here is is about I think the challenge here is about priority setting within mm -hmm. that framework, within the ACT Accelerator framework, and I think that ultimately comes down to uh, to a governance uh, challenge, but but I think that's a little bit beyond the scope of what we're what we will be discussing here today. But but I think that ultimately is is what it comes down to. Thanks, James. Uh, I've got one final question for you, and that's uh, with regards to uh, what do you think the delivery systems are going to be? Should we come up with effective interventions or effective vaccines? Um, in in the poorest countries, healthcare workers, there's always a shortage of them. Uh, have you been wondering about the role, of, uh, what task shifting in the context of pandemic delivery looks like? Well, so this, this the way I think about this is very simple. Um, uh, there's the actual technology itself, and then there's the system for delivery of that technology. Um, and if, uh, there is genuinely to be equitable access uh, to that uh, technology. Uh, the technology and the system for delivery has to match uh, the, the contextual reality uh, in which uh, the technology will be delivered. And so um, attention to, for example, the stability of a compound uh, in uh, variable humid, uh, humidity uh, context is extremely important. The galanics, for example, of, of uh, uh, of drug development are, are equally important to the identification and, and appropriate targeting of, a, of uh, for example, a new chemical entity. So the technology itself is extremely important. It has to match the context in which it will be delivered. Um, and then the system itself has to uh, reach to the farthest uh, corners of uh, community. And so uh, it cannot simply be a highly structured, for example, tertiary care system. It must be obviously that, but it must also uh, be a community-based system. Uh, so the 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 um, development of a particular technology, whether it's a diagnostic, a drug, or a vaccine, it has to be stable enough to be used uh, in the farthest reaches of a, a, a society where the most vulnerable people um, uh, uh, exist. And so those are, again, very simple, very, um, you know, almost generic uh, um, uh, concepts, but are really fundamental 
uh, to this idea of equitable access uh, to healthcare technology. And I would I'll just make my sort of final comment, Ed, if you will, that you know this is this is really this is really about wise self-interest, uh, uh, in the sense that unless all people have access to uh, um, uh, new uh, uh, technologies, um, all people will be vulnerable uh, to uh, variations and, and perturbations uh, in uh, um, uh, the evolution of this particular uh, pandemic. We cannot ensure our own wellness in this kind of context. We, we, no one person can, can ensure their own wellness without considering and being aware of and acting to ensure the wellness of others. And so in that sense, it is wise self-interest to develop uh, 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 appropriate strategies around equitable uh, access to new healthcare technologies uh, for COVID. Thank you, James. I really appreciate your insights. Um, now I have the great pleasure to introduce Dr. Derek Angus coming in from Chicago. Uh, Derek is a uh, professor and chair at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, he is chair of critical care medicine. He's currently leading some of the most exciting clinical trials related to COVID. Um, he's going to talk today about Remap Cap, uh, a, a, a multi-arm platform trial. Very exciting. And then Derek, I know you're also involved with Crown Coronation. It'd be great if you could uh, address some issues related to that. Um, so, could you tell us a, a little bit about the trials you're involved in at the moment, Derek? Sure. After I first remember to unmute. So first of all, um, thanks very much for um, for inviting me to this session. And maybe before jumping right into my trials, I'm, I'm I was trying to think about what I was going to talk about in the context of these pretty sobering uh, words from James that really that really give some context to the challenges behind the title of this session. Um, and I would say that as a I don't know if I describe myself as a trialist, but if I go back to the title and I think about this notion of drug development, I do think that drug development has to have its root somewhere in causal inference, whether it's traditional randomized trials or quasi-experimental designs, but somehow one wants to be generating evidence with some reasonable strength of causal inference. And so if I go back to the title of your slide and then I think about James's comments, I think about running RCTs uh, uh, in emerging economy settings can be challenging at the best of times. Um, running RCTs in the middle of COVID, even in high income settings, has totally brought us to our knees. <laughs> and as James pointed out, um, one of the problems for COVID uh, as it runs through emerging economies is that it's almost like a pandemic syndemic. He gave the example of tuberculosis. There's going to be these unpredictable knock-on effects of social determinants and different diseases colliding into each other, which then it's hard to get your head around even what the conceptual model is for then working out what interventions you'd be testing in this setting. So then when I go back to all of that, first of all, I end up thinking that what I'm working on feels puny in comparison to uh, what what uh, the scope of the problem that James is, is laying out. But let me start to make a couple of comments. Uh, I got involved in thinking about adaptive platform trials in response to pandemics, in part because I was part of a global community of trialists, especially in the critical care space, who got together essentially to lick our wounds after making such a meaningless contribution to the understanding of the right treatment for H1N1. While our colleagues in virology had done an amazing job of typing the virus, tracing it genetically around the world and so on, the clinical trials enterprise had really, you know, despite being well-meaning, had hardly, they tried to launch trials, but they couldn't, by the time the trial launched in a given place, uh, nothing, you know, no, no patients could be enrolled because the pandemic had rolled through. And that led to a series of discussions that led us to thinking we really need to think about a type of adaptive platform trial. But unlike some of the classic oncology uh, platform trials like iSpy2, this trial had to think about some key issues right up front. First, 
for when pandemics come through, you want the trial design to be really embedded because you really want to try to pick up every patient possibly. It's not like um, a breast cancer trial where it's you've got two weeks after the biopsy to type and then carefully decide the entry criteria. And it's not a phase two trial where you're only going to enroll a few patients. You want to capture, as the entire disease comes through like a tsunami, you'd want to be getting as many patients as possible in the trial. So our remap design is a randomized, because we still want randomization at the heart of it, embedded um, thinking about cultural embedding, thinking about strategies that um, makes it easy for the person at the at the bedside to actually engage in the research and and to make it not feel like it's a choice between research and care. Um, multifactorial in that we re it's like lots of basket trials being layered on top of each other because there's many questions to be asked simultaneously about supportive care, therapies, and so on. And then to be highly adaptive, uh, we do believe in having RAR in our design. I know people are writing about not doing RAR in infectious disease, but if you put time in the model and you're thoughtful about it, you can have RAR. And we felt like RAR was an important thing to offer to partners that provide care who don't want to randomize. Uh, who don't want to put patient in placebo. Uh, in conversations after MERS-CoV, there was a big feeling that maybe no one should be randomized. It was unethical. And so we think it's important to have designs where almost everyone is getting active treatment and where there's a commitment to push as many patients to the best performing therapies as fast as possible. And some of those principles, I think, can translate to any setting, high income settings and emerging economies. And then finally, we thought it needed to run as a platform trial, the idea of being there's a master protocol and common entry criteria. But as I've gone into this COVID epidemic, I've been thinking about platform in more than one way. Um, one is, <clears throat> I think that you have to unhook the entire process from any particular IVRS and data management system and from any particular coordinating group and think about the entire trial as almost like a meme where you try to write the entire instruction manual, and then almost anyone could, not just the protocol, but the entire structure of the trial, the idea that you could then load it up in different settings and customize it. So, um, so Remap Cap is running in 13 countries, and it's definitely running with a focus in high income countries, although we think we have a path for running in community and city public hospitals in Brazil. I think if we made a move, and we're in lots of conversations about making a move into Africa and certain parts of Asia, it would almost run as a, a separate model. I think the entire primary outcome probably changes, the care setting maybe changes, but some of the philosophy may translate. I'd be petrified about doing hand-me-down strategies, things that worked in high-income countries might be disastrous in low-income settings. But I do think there are probably some principles that might translate. For example, we try to run our trial on networks. We try to get networks of existing trialists that want to run it. And I think an investment, for example, in trying to do a real learning platform with causal inference, for example, across Africa, it would be nice to invest in existing or somewhat nascent African-based um, clinical trial consortium. With that, I'll, that was probably probably said more than I should. So. That's fantastic, Derek. Derek, I wonder if I could ask you a question about um, enrollment within trials. This disease moves fast, right? Or that's what it appears to do. It's, it comes into a community fast, and then we scramble to set up a clinical trial. And by the time that we've set up the clinical trial in terms of enrollment, maybe the disease has moved on and it's difficult to enroll. And as you know from the tracker that you've mentioned before, the COVID um, tracker, trials tracker, uh, there's more than 700 trials have been set up around the world. Uh, many of them, for example, more than 300 from China won't fulfill and have met their enrollment. Have you thought about what the mishmash of trials is going to look like um, when it has passed, the, the, when the pandemic, if the pandemic passes in a community. Right. 
so I would say there's two ways of thinking of it. One is how you can combine all these little trials. And I think Robin later in this session will probably be much more erudite on that point than me. The other is maybe to be aspirational about what ought to happen. So our trial remap cap um, got funded initially under the EU under something called the Prepare Consortium that tried to imagine the idea that you ran a master protocol embedded in a like a spider's web across the globe, actually asking inter-pandemic questions. So we knew that viral pneumonia was the most common cause of pandemics. And so we said, well, pneumonia, even in inter-pandemic, is just a blight on the world. Have an adaptive platform trial running across the world, addressing questions already in place in inter-pandemic mode, using a design where you simply add new domains as a quick amendment when in pandemic mode. And so that was the goal. And I would say we were just getting our feet under us uh, when COVID-19, like if it was COVID-20, I think we would be more than aspirational. You know, we, we were in the process of getting countries set up. And if we'd had another year, I think we could have had a better mm -hmm. proof testing. But, but it might be true that the world is now ready, especially since this pandemic will be with us for arguably a couple of years. It might be true that we can still commit to having a, like a global spider's web of sites that are capable of enrolling, even if it's only a few patients, and then places that go hot can capture a lot of cases. So that would be my aspirational goal, is that we do actually have a live, adequately deployed, prospective platform of platforms, etc. Um, the alternative is to take what we've got already, lots of little trials, and now try to sticky tape them all together. And I totally want to hear how Robin's going to do that. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, Derek. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to my co-moderator, Craig Rayner. Great. Thanks, Ted. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm Craig Grader, uh, President of Integrated Drug Development at Satara. Uh, look, I think almost 12 months ago, uh, we established a global uh, practice area, uh, which was motivated by very meaningful therapeutic development collaborations in the global health community. And uh, a really important part of our inspiration uh, was the sustained leadership shown by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So uh, it really does stand to reason I'm really excited to be introducing our, our, next, uh, our next two speakers. So uh, the first of those is, is uh, Dr. Robin Mogg. Uh, Robin is the clinical biostatistics leader at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute. Uh, Robin has a, a very seasoned career um, uh, starting at Merck and uh, working on early and late stage vaccine development uh, and was one of the protocol statisticians on the STEP study for Merck's experimental HIV vaccine. Uh, during her initial 14 years at Merck, she supported uh, many early development candidates across lots of areas uh, with a particular focus on developing and promoting uh, innovative statistical approaches to enable efficient uh, early clinical de uh, decision making. So Bayesian designs, go no go decision rules uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, in 2014, uh, Robin joined uh, Janssen and uh, her focus shifted to some later stage activities and uh, uh, in, importantly uh, was involved in simulation based evaluations of the novel adaptive phase three trial design for an, an Ebola vaccine candidate that was uh, uh, being examined in 2014 in the, uh, the outbreak in West Africa. Um, uh, uh, back to Merck in, in 2016, uh, Robin had a, 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 a large group who she was supporting and was a key contributor of Keytruda um, and joined Gates MRI in 2018. And she's really been honing all of her statistical expertise uh, into the areas of helping fight against TB, malaria, and enteric and diarrheal diseases. So it's with my absolute pleasure that um, uh, to, to introduce uh, uh, Robin, and I'd love to hear about some of your perspectives that Derek's already touched on as um, how do we manage this tsunami of grey data? Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you so much 
Craig and Ed for inviting me to be part of this very prestigious panel today. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the opportunities that I think we may have around aggregation of data. Um, uh, first, I just want to say that for those of you that don't know, the Gates Medical Research Institute is a wholly controlled subsidiary of the Gates Foundation, and we are a nonprofit biotech that does sponsor and run clinical trials. So as the clinical biostatistics leader at Gates MRI, my job is essentially to design, oversee, and analyze data from these trials that we are sponsoring primarily in the TB space at the moment. Um, we're pretty young as an organization, only about two and a half years old. And so most of the work I've done so far is around trial design. And with respect to trial design, I am just a huge proponent of the use of doing things like clinical trial simulation to, to help in, in designing these trials. Even in normal times, there's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty on the assumptions that we have to make on things like en enrolling, uh, underlying incidence of disease, consistency of treatment effects across various subgroups of interest. So, you know, I, I really take it as a, uh, you know, my, my, my goal in, in doing these sorts of examinations is to help guide clinical and regulatory and other colleagues to make the best informed decisions about how we can design trials so that we can answer our primary questions of interest with the data that we collect in a causal way, as Derek was suggesting. But even for a perfectly designed trial, one that is really well set up to answer these primary questions of interest, there's still incredibly good rationale to later combine the data uh, that we collect with other sources for the purpose of answering additional secondary or exploratory questions. Um, a, a relevant example right now is um, at the multitude of hydroxychloroquine studies being done in the pre and post exposure prophylaxis setting. Um, these trials may individually be powered to show reasonable efficacy against infection with SARS-CoV-2, but there are other, uh, other endpoints that these individual trials may not be statistically powered to show. For example, uh, rare endpoints like efficacy against more severe, severe disease outcomes or an increase in a specific safety signal. So I think the benefits of combining relevant data sources uh, to answer questions like this is really pretty obvious. Um, but not without complexity. Um, although oftentimes, and unfortunately, kind of potentially in the situation we're in now, the ability to answer even primary trial questions could evade us because the assumptions we make when designing our trials may turn out to be different than those than the, what we had expected. Um, I, there's just a plethora of literature reviews that highlight how many trials fail under the best of circumstances because we have inadequate power at the end to answer the pre-specified questions of interest. And in the setting of a pandemic, I think these, these risks are even higher. Um, I've, sp I've spent a lot of my career thinking through frameworks and strategies to do things, to do what I'll call like data-driven, continuous learning and confirming, where you combine data from various sources to answer very specific questions of interest. I've done this mostly in the context of exploratory framework. When I was at Merck and we were looking at uh, trials within pembrolizumab, we really were focused on identifying biomarkers associated with treatment response. And we did all that after answering primary trial objective questions. Even though this framework was exploratory, I think, and the data were kind of recycled through primary objectives, uh, the process that we used was still very thoughtful. It was perspective. And very and statistically rigorous. Um, I think we're in a very tricky situation right now because the COVID-19 pandemic has, of course, spawned hundreds of trials, and each of them uh, are individually designed to answer their own questions. Um, but unfortunately, with the tremendous amount of uncertainty coupled with the changing pandemic, these answering these questions individually within individual trials, I think, is going to be very difficult. Um, so I think we need to be bold and kind of brave about what we can do collectively over what we can accomplish individually. Um, and that has to be done potentially outside of this exploratory framework. You know, I think everything I've said so far maybe is not terribly novel. Um, and how we do it is going to be um, very, we're going to need to be very thoughtful about. So I think, I guess what I... I'll end with saying is that um, 
you know, I think there's three really important points to the concepts of aggregating data. I, I think, well, first, the context of aggregating data, this has been done multiple times, and we can always aggregate data after we uh, finish trials and mine it and use really sophisticated quantitative methods to generate biologically and scientific questions of interest. This is extremely important, but that's not exactly the context that I'm talking about and have been working on now. The more, I think we need to be prospectively thoughtful about aggregating data in the context of using the data to draw relatively confirmatory conclusions. And we need to do that um, by you know, being very purposeful in that and really identifying what these questions are, writing them down, aligning on what they are, what the endpoints are that are of most interest. We need to do it with a certain level of urgency um, and we need to do it with a certain level of rigor. You know, I'm a statistician, I'm trained to think about river, rigor. When I look at data results, I generally think about what else could be explaining what I'm seeing. Um, and so I think instilling the rigor will also build the trust that we need to get the buy-in from those who have ownership over these different data sources and get them comfortable to, to share it. Um, as far as outside the, the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, I'm really hopeful that the opportunities that I've been working on over the last four to six weeks have that have quickly materialized about the importance of potentially sharing and aggregating data uh, will be, um, you know, translate after the pandemic is over because we're doing a lot of difficult work at the Gates MRI and other disease areas that suffer from these very same problems. Maybe but people don't have the, the same urgency around them. So, uh, you know, I'm really hopeful that um, the implications of using these concepts around data aggregation in a prospective and rigorous way will, will have enormous impact for drug development in lower middle income countries. Well, thank, thanks so, so much, Robin. I think maybe just one, one, one quick question uh, before we move on to our next speaker and then we will, um, uh, come back with some more broad questions for the panel thereafter. Uh, you know, you touched briefly upon um, uh, barriers. You know, I think that clearly there's a lot of um, potential data sources out there. Uh, there's large pharma, there is uh, research institutes, academic driven studies. And what, what are you seeing as the largest barrier for being able to uh, have this um, uh, sharing of data, or, of, or you know, pre-competitive data in 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 a moment like this. What what is what is, what is the biggest barrier for actually making uh, this data ha happen? Is it actually people um, uh, giving uh, giving the IP away, or is it the operational elements of actually getting things? housed and, um, and technology, technologically connected to each other in an appropriate framework. What, what are the biggest barriers to where we are today? Well, there's lots of barriers, right? No question. Um, I would say, I'll touch on just a couple of them. Some barriers are that people feel that they're nervous about sharing their data too early. Um, they're spending a lot of time and effort on collecting it and they wanna make sure they're handing it over to people that they trust are gonna do the right things with it and they're gonna have a say in how those data are used and they wanna be part of it. Everyone wants to be part of it, of course. Um, and, and that's completely understandable. Um, another barrier is the lack of consistency about endpoints that are being collected. And so we need to really have people thinking about this 24 seven is how can we combine these, these different uh, measurements across different studies. I, I'm less concerned, I'm designing a trial right now about what is our primary endpoint definition for the trial itself and more concerned that we're gonna be collecting the right measurements so that in the end, when it's all said and done, we can put it in context with other trials that are ongoing. And I think we all need to think like that as we're designing studies. Um, it's important to have integrity of individual trials, of course, but we need to also understand when maybe we need to let go the ideal that we're going to be able to achieve that within an individual study and really push together to uh, make people comfortable that we can do things together instead of individually. Those are barriers that I don't have all the right solutions to, but I'm hoping that we're starting to build the solutions that people get buy-in. The best thing I, I think too is to 
understand who wants to be part of it and work within the confines of that. And then hopefully with the success, you can bring other people in. You're not going to you're not going to make everyone want to be part of it from the beginning. And so, you know, start small and, and, and try and be successful in places. It, Right. Look, no, I think there's some really um, uh, learned experience and and and, and wise uh, uh, wise aspects there, um, particularly that you know working with people who get it and who want to work uh, in that kind of way. I think is 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 obviously where you have alignment of culture and mindset. I think is is always one of the 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 best places to start. So, Robin, I'm sure we'll we'll loop back to you in the rest of the question time. But thank you very much for your presentation. I found it extremely insightful. I'm sure um, everyone else did as as well. So, so with that, let me let me shift now to introduce our our last speaker. Um, our last speaker is Trevor Mundell. Uh, he's president of the Global Health Division at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He leads the foundation's efforts to develop uh, high impact, um, uh, high impact interventions against leading causes of death and disability in developing countries. He manages a, a very broad portfolio of activities, uh, looking at uh, specific R and D investments in HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, pneumonia, enteric and diarrheal diseases, and neglected tropical diseases at the foundation. He manages uh, cross-cutting product development programs, including the uh, discovery and translational sciences, innovative technology solutions, uh, integrated development, uh, as well as the vaccine development and surveillance. So quite a quite a large brief um, uh, that Trevor has under his, his purview. And he has to work very closely with a lot of people um, and collaborate with a lot of people with a, with a broad international network of grantees and partners. Uh, prior to joining the foundation in 2011, uh, Trevor was the global head of development at Novartis and previously was involved in clinical research also at Pfizer and Park Davis. Uh, born and raised in South Africa, uh, Trevor earned his bachelor's and medical degrees from the University of uh, Witwatersrand, and I hope I got that right, in Johannesburg. Uh, he also studied uh, mathematics, logic, philosophy as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford and earned his PhD in mathematics at the University of Chicago. So Trevor, look, thank you so much for joining us today. Very much looking forward to hearing uh, your insights and perspectives on new opportunities and implications for the future of drug development and emerging economies. Well, thanks, Craig. And I think we've had a lot of great ideas from, from Derek James and, and Robin already over here. But, um, you know, as I, I sit and I watch what's unfolding over here, there's a certain sense that uh, the work that uh, the Gates Foundation has been involved in, uh, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa and in South Asia, around those diseases you mentioned, the, the plagues that continue to um, really trouble those regions like malaria, HIV, tuberculosis. Uh, in, in some ways, that's what we do on a daily basis. And now we have this global problem which uh, puts at a global level many of those issues that we faced uh, in the field you know, for the last many years. And it just came home to me in, in the sense of the problem that we have in lower middle income countries is a lack of infrastructure. So health infrastructure, both to treat populations, but also even to do clinical trials, which we have uh, in, let's say, North America and um, in Europe. What has happened with COVID is a type of leveling of the field because in low and middle income countries, there's a supply issue of infrastructure. And what we saw and what we see ongoing now uh, in the high income countries is the surge of need around ventilators, uh, intensive care types of uh, investments, uh, greatly exceeded by the requirements of the infection. And it comes down to amazingly simple things which can fool us. So, you know, in the US and in Europe, running out of swabs, the very simple thing for testing, it's not being so much as on the back end PCR machines to do the testing, running out of swabs and uh, not being able to do nasopharyngeal testing. So the first part of this response, we found ourselves in the position of uh, working to, to guide groups to prove that a simple nasal swab with a Q-tip like swab, which can be produced at billions, was as good in terms of detecting viral load as the 
healthcare uh, professional determine nasopharyngeal swab. So something as simple as that can completely uh, foul up the system. And of course, if we can't do adequate testing and large-scale testing, then trials themselves become uh, problematic. But you know, to the trials point, this is really the yeah, for everybody's involved in clinical trials, whether it's from the academic sector, whether it's from the, the private sector, um, this is the challenge of a lifetime. Uh, as the people have mentioned, with the waxing and waning of the infection in different regions, you can be starting trials in China and then unable to complete them because they're no longer any patients and we've been through that. So the exercise that we have over here is how do we have a global network and, you know, realistically, you know, as Derek was mentioning, it's probably a network of networks. Uh, there are many networks in Africa that we've engaged in, in malaria trials, other um, disease trials over there that can jump in over here. And then South Asia has got extensive networks uh, for sure. But how do we pull all of these networks together now so that we can actually track the waxing and waning of the epidemic? And the, the vision that we have around that is first based on a couple of things. First of all, we need a common agreed upon data management layer underneath these trials. So even if the trials are independently defined, could we not have a common data layer? Around certain things that are critically important, like really professional monitoring, so that at the end of the day, we have data that can quickly be put into a format that could be submitted for regulatory decision making. The regulators are not going to drop their standards in terms of wanting good demonstration of efficacy and safety. I mean, there are some elements of programs that they're going to show some flexibility on, but having basic data like that, and if they can't evaluate that data, that's going to lead to endless delays, and it's not going to be their fault. It's going to be because a lot of junky data was put in Excel spreadsheets and shipped to them, and that can't happen. So um, we need that data uh, management layer, uh, absolutely. And then how are we going to do this other thing of matching the recruitment of patients to where the event rates are high enough so we could actually see some effects, particularly for vaccines. A number of the pharmaceutical companies have got global dashboards that they use to monitor their, their global clinical trials. And we've managed to have um, access to, to some of the best of those now. So we would have that infrastructure that has been becoming pervasive in industry of being able to map your global trials, be able to know what's going on at sites with enrollment, know where there are issues with data quality, be able to do targeted monitoring, actually even online monitoring, digital monitoring, which is going to be necessary over here. So that we have. And then what about the input into that system? Well, in the input, we need a prediction system of where this epidemic is going. And there have been a couple of uh, systems which have been widely used. Uh, one of the groups that we fund, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, has uh, developed a prediction system which has been, been widely used. Uh, it's one of those. What we need is something that can give us reasonably accurate predictions at least, let's say, four to six weeks out. We know that you can't switch on in 24 hours a clinical site. You have to have some lead time. So if we could have a reasonably accurate prediction system, which is now being built, I would say, for the high-income countries, and it's become reasonably good, but is really lacking for many parts of Africa and South Asia. So we need the prediction system locked into the dashboard, then we can shift around, and we have the data management uh, underneath all of that. Um, you know, it, it in some ways um, is something new, and it's built on a lot of ideas that have been pervasive uh, in many areas, talked about for years. But I do hope that you know we can use the tragedy that we're in right now to build some structures and build some new tools and new ways of doing things that are going to have lasting good. So if we can come out of this with something really built at the end of the day that goes beyond the immediate problem, then we will have added a lot of value. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, <clears throat> if I, I might ask one, one question and then, the, uh, and then uh, op open it up. I think one, one of the things that, you know, we've heard about the, the, the sheer volume of trials, you know, 700 trials or more. Um, when we actually look into a number of those trials, 
Um, not all of them are as elegant as Remmat Cat. Um, we have uh, we have uh, small cohort studies, just single intervention arms, uh, cohort studies, um, single doses which are being being looked at. And you know, I um, looking at uh, the concept of optimal dose because um, at the end of the day. It is, if we're looking at a therapeutic, which is going to be sent out to be, be used, every milligram above optimal um, is less for others. It's larger manufacturing requirements. It's a higher burden on supply chains versus every milligram below optimal is really giving the virus a bit of a chance to try to outsmart our interventions and, and perhaps not have a, uh, an effective treatment. You know, I, I guess I, I would be really interested um, in any insights or suggestions that you might have on, on how with all of this information where um, there's very little information being looked at dose ranging across the plethora of studies, how do we get to an optimal dose? How do we, how do we, how do we, uh, how are we able to do that? Because if we double the dose, we actually double the manufacturing requirements. Um, so really interested to, to, to have your perspective on, on that. Yeah, Craig, you touch on an absolutely critical issue because of the constraints we have in terms of manufacturing and the need for many of the interventions to scale to billions of either doses or you know, in vaccines as well, uh, doses of vaccines. And that being um, you know, a challenge which manufacturing industry has never surmounted at that kind of scale. We've never had the scale of requirement before. So the dose can completely trip us up. I'll give you some examples. One of the key vaccines, uh, the dose uncertainty is between 25 micrograms and 250 micrograms. And the difference, and they are, both ends are in the picture. It's uh -huh. not impossible that 25 works and 250 maybe the dose that's required at the end of the day. And the difference between that is that we might have 50 million uh, doses in the first year available for manufacturing or 500 million. And the difference is then in an inordinate amount of lives. On the antibody front, we have a conundrum there where we are thinking about a dose range between 100 milligrams and four grams. So either we're gonna have one or two million doses, or we might have, you know, 30 to 50 million doses, covering maybe all healthcare workers or even high-risk individuals. So everything that we've learned about dose now really, really matters. And, um, you know, the, the desire, of course, is to plunge ahead with a selected dose, rule of thumb, and get into phase three. And I understand that completely, and I'll mention, you know, why there is that, have that urgency on that. But we are going to have to have just a, you know, a dose ranging up front, just even from that manufacturing constraint perspective, because we can't have that range of uncertainty as we go into uh, trying to scale up essentially for the, for the world. You know, on the efficacy fund, let's take vaccines in particular. I think there's an emerging fear, and I, it's very realistic, that we may only get one or at most two efficacy trials done for vaccines, which means that unless we develop a correlate, correlate of protection, the, all the vaccines lined up behind, which may be the better vaccines at the end of the day, are out of luck, never gonna execute uh, a study. So, you know, having a correlate, which will of course help a lot with the dose finding for subsequent programs that come along, along is important in you know, both vaccines and potentially some of the, the drug and monoclonal antibody programs. Great. Look, thank you very much, Trevor. I, I think I'll now pivot some, some questions to our, our other colleagues in the, the five minutes that we have left. I think maybe picking up on that thread, um, Derek, I might move towards you on this one. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, in, in REM Matt Cap, you, you've got a, a very elegant um, platform design study. Um, you know, as Trevor was talking about, you know, there's this criticality of this thing called dose at the end of the day. Uh, and any time we talk about dose, it's the science of dosing. We start to get into translational pharmacology. We start to get into those things called pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And as Trevor alluded to, you know, proxies of, of outcome, whether it's viral shedding or whatever, that whilst the 
the, the overall outcome for a clinical trial from an RCT perspective, um, you, you know, may be, may be quite clear from an endpoint in the studies. Uh, there are these other um, signals that you could be using within those, within those studies that might help provide additional guidance into what, what dosing would be. So uh, it's a long lead into a question which is, you know, are, are you applying any PKPD or any of those principles in REMMAT CAP? Is that something that is useful? You know, we, we even saw a compassionate use study come out with remdesivir recently where there was no reported PK in that. My question is perhaps if there was, there could have been some more insights into exposure response that might have suggested that there was a drug effect. So interested if you could comment on that. Yeah. <laughs> you just keep on layering on more and more impossible questions. So we know yeah. so little about this mechanism of disease that some, and some of the interventions, of course, are things like monoclonals, where PK uh, studies, et cetera, might not even mean anything. I mean, we know nothing. Let, let's say you were giving drugs that were trying to manipulate the ACE2 binding. Uh, uh, we don't even know enough about how dynamic ACE2 expression is. We don't really know whether most of the disease is due to ACE2 binding and internalization in the pneumocytes or whether it's about endothelial uh, cell ACE2 expression. So even if you could tell me that you were blocking ACE2, I would then say to you, where? <laughs> what would represent effective um, manipulation of ACE2. We don't, we don't have strong animal models yet. We haven't got years of work of validating strong mechanistic readouts that then correlate with clinical outcomes. Uh, I was in an email exchange this morning with someone. <clears throat> um, we received a study at JAMA um, where uh, people were talking about um, using low-dose radiation. And we said, well, that's interesting. Uh, it seems quite, uh, everyone has heard an extraordinary list of potential interventions. But then we said, well, what would be the, the proximate readout or the early mechanistic readout to work out whether they were sort of on the right path or not? And it's incredibly difficult. Even, you know, as you alluded to, I'm gonna stop talking in a second, but as you alluded to uh, PCR shading, obviously for antivirals, um, you might look at lack of, you know, decreased PCR shedding might at least suggest that you're arresting viral replication. It's not exactly the same as infectivity, but it might be a reasonable proxy. Um, and so we would look at that for antivirals if we were do, trying to do like a roll-in or of a phase two. But for yeah. nearly every other intervention, most of the proximate outcomes are actually quite close to things like these ordinal scales. It would be resolution of organ dysfunction, et cetera. And most of those studies, you, you likely need several hundred patients, even for a moderate effect. And if you go back to looking for things that are having small effects, like odd ratios of 1.2 or 1.3 to improve recovery, that would be fantastic. But that needs lots and lots of patients. So this is a long way of saying is it, it's very tricky when we're dealing with such a plethora of different agents that work in so many different ways in a disease for which we know so little. Great. No, thank you. And, um, uh, you know, the step, the step change, you know, uh, sequential drug development where we might be able to do a lot of these, have a lot of these questions answered and then move into that. Um, uh, it really doesn't apply where we are. So it's, it's, it's it needing to parallel process so many thoughts at the same time. So with that, I'm going to switch to Robin. Uh, and, um, you know, Robin, I'd be, you know, just, just interested from, from your perspective, um, a, 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 you know, again, a, a, as to, you know, pooling various studies, do you think that there might be ways to get insights um, uh, on optimal dosing through the this 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 grey literature that's out there that might better inform, um, you know, do we go with a, a high dose that perhaps might be effective in a community but can then look at a lower dose that can be scalable and purposed in a low middle income country? Interested in your your context there? 
I mean, I think a lot of that will depend on, you know, what data we have available. And so I think we need people really actively searching the, the, the trial landscape to understand what trials will best answer which questions and then how we can put those trials together in a meaningful way to actually answer those questions of interest. Um, I can envision, for example, various trials using different doses or dose regimens of, say, hydroxychloroquine because it's so common and there's so many trials, and kind of in doing some clever analyses to try and tease out is there some level of a dose response effect on, on various endpoints of interest. I think that's doable, um, but I think it needs to be pretty, you know, to, we need to think about really the right way to do that and really align on on what the right strategy to do that is. And then, you know, go after those studies that can help you answer the question you have the best. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so uh, a last question, um, given that we're, we're, we're over time, but I do want to give James an opportunity um, as well uh, before we go. So, 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 so James, um, you know, we've heard a lot of talk, um, I guess, uh, in the media relating to repurposing of, of a whole range of medicines, whether they be, you know, macrocyclic lactones like ivermectin or whether they be uh, anti-malarials and so on. Um, and, you know, I guess the concept of repurposing compounds that already exist um, that um, are really, really, really important medications to be um, to, to be uh, applied in lower middle income countries. You know, there's there's always the potential for impacting supply chain and potential collateral damage um, for for um, other diseases. And you know, and is the uh, is the treatment worse than the cure from that perspective? I, I'd really like to hear your thoughts um, as to um, you know, the potential choices which we make um, with, with drugs like hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine or, or ivermectin and, the, and the, the potential impact that this may have in, in patients who desperately need them in, in, for, for other indications in low middle income countries. Yeah, well, I would just say, uh, uh, Greg, that, that uh, a repurposing um, uh, it, the science may indicate that, that in fact, that that is uh, a valid and appropriate uh, response. Uh, it certainly has been the case uh, uh, with many other diseases in the past. But repurposing does not mean um, uh, approaching supply uh, in the same way uh, as one did yesterday. Uh, if drugs are to be repurposed, uh, we are going to have to massively increase production of those repurposed drugs uh, so that uh, the, the new need, COVID, uh, does not uh, uh, eliminate the possibility of addressing uh, a pre-existing need, uh, malaria, uh, for example. Uh, so it's a very, again, a very simple answer, uh, but uh, um, uh, I think, you know, a basic approach to, to, to uh, to the new reality of COVID and its and its uh, its cascading effects. Great. Look, well, thank you very much, James. And look, uh, I'd like to thank everyone, um, all, all of the panelists uh, for uh, for today, and uh, for everyone online attending today's uh, webinar, which was new opportunities and implications for the future of drug development in emerging economies. On behalf of uh, myself and also my, my co-moderator, Ed Mills, um, uh, Satara and Saitel, uh, and, and our presenters, I'd really like to thank you for, your, uh, for joining us today and have a, a great rest of your day.